so yeah, I'll talk about you know some of the different projects I do and what I'm doing at the moment in that way and trying to connect it to the theme of the talk as well. Um, so I was talking with, um, I'm working on a new book at the moment, which is a collaboration with my wife, um, Anna, who's here today. Um, and she, she said something to me a couple of weeks ago, which was the first time I've ever heard it said, and I'd never thought about it with my work, but it actually makes complete sense, is that she said it was, she wishes it was a book that we didn't have to make. And I obviously knew exactly what she meant by that, because whilst I love taking photographs, um, I, I love the process of telling other people's stories and sharing those stories with you today, for instance. Um, most of the subjects of my work are things that we all wish didn't happen, hadn't happened, or aren't happening at the moment. So the new book, whilst it's a work that we've wanted to make for a few years, and it's about a place that's incredibly beautiful and full of childhood innocence and memory and beautiful lives, it's also now becoming a piece of work where we talk about burying the dead, which is something that no one likes to really have to talk about. But that's the new work that we're making at the moment, and I'll touch on that a little bit more towards the end of the work. Um, so although a lot of my work is landscape-based, none of my work is just about the landscape, because a landscape by itself is nothing more, and talking about Joe's work again, um, there's nothing more than just a, a chocolate box or a tea box <laughs> in some cases. Um, you know, all the images I have, the landscapes are obviously full of the people in those landscapes, the stories, the people that live in those places now, or the people that did live in those places, or that were taken to those places. And what I found is I made my work, such as here, which is um, a ghetto, a former ghetto from the Second World War in Dej in Romania. Um, I said, as I started making my work, I was faced with something that I'd never seen before, which was the interaction of current day humans, for want of a better word, with these landscapes, these landscapes that had a very specific story from the past. And I would notice that the reaction of the people that lived or recreated in these places today was sometimes very much dependent on what signs were given in the landscape, whether they were being told about what had happened in these places, whether they were being told or were aware of the stories and the events that had happened. And then sometimes I would notice a reaction where that knowledge seemed to make no difference at all, potentially. And it took me a long time to try and work out why people would react to these places in different ways and the way they did. And I'm not certain whether I still understand that. I think it's a long-term process. But I remember here, and so the ghetto, which was the largest outdoor, outdoor ghetto in Europe during um, the Second World War and the Holocaust, was at the top of the hill that you can see behind you in the forest, in the background behind the river. And it's part of Rita's story, which is one of the 22 stories that I followed making, this, making the work of Wounded Landscape. And I remember when I was there taking pictures, you know, I, I was in a way lucky that I went there with prior knowledge. I, that's why I went to that specific location. I knew what had happened there. I knew what had happened to specific people there. I knew the history of the place. But I remember when I was there, there's basically just a forest and a small memorial stone and a very small kind of sculpture. And it was a snowy day, as you can see. And I remember being very struck that there was a, a family. It was like a mum and a dad, I assumed, and their daughter. who was wearing a little red coat, and she was maybe four or five years old. And they were teaching her how to toboggan on a sledge in and out over the memorial stones. And I remember they had a small dog, and the dog was cocking its leg and having a pee against the plaque that was there. And then just to the side of that plaque, there was a small kind of field area, and there was three young guys who were doing donuts in their cars on the snow. And I remember being really struck by it. And that's something that, whilst I made this work, a wounded landscape that took me five or six years in total, kind of followed me around. And it's one of the things that, although I probably never showed it in the photographs, it really struck me as a, um, a very interesting part of our human relations with the landscape and how we look at things and whether we need to have knowledge of the places that we visit, or whether uh, some of us prefer not to have any knowledge, or whether we're given that knowledge physically in front of us with an inscription or memorial stone, if we choose to ignore that and why we do those things, whether we're trying to you know, collectively banish these memories and these histories from our past in that way. So what I found is that as I, as I made the work, which was in this case based around 22 stories of uh, people who either survived the Holocaust or family members of those who didn't survive and were murdered, or a combination of the two, um, 
is that certain elements of the individual stories started coming through to me. And I remember Shmuel, who I met here in Tel Aviv, in Israel, um, and we spoke for two days in total. And I'd always make these portraits after we had sat and spoke, and I was very, very lucky to be given that time. Often the conversation prior to us meeting was, I have 15 minutes, Mark, for you, or I have half an hour for you, I'm, I'm tired, I'm not feeling that well, or in Shmuel's case, I have a meeting to go to, et cetera, et cetera, family events and things like that. But with him, it ended up two full days. The first day was mostly conversation, um, and the second day was lunch and conversation. And I remember him saying something very specific to me. Um, he was talking about how people had uh, spoken about him and spoken about other people like him um, in being saved, that he was saved from the Holocaust, that he was saved from the camps, etc., etc. But he was incredibly strong in telling me that that was not true in any way. And that whilst there were people that saved others, you know, as we know, which is great, and he said to me, he said, I'm a survivor. And I remember being really, really struck by that. And I remember that throughout most of the 22 stories and the people that I spoke with and the stories I listened to, that's one of the things that was concurrent throughout their, their words to me, that they spoke about surviving. And in some ways, that's the idea is that about surviving through that landscape. And I think it's really important for me, from my point of view, um, that these memories and these stories of that landscape survive, which is why I make photographs of these things, which is my, why I make books that I wish I didn't have to make, so that you can read them, and then you can take those stories and you can share them with other people. Um, <coughs> one of the other people I spoke to was Rita, who also lived in Tel Aviv, and I met her about four days after meeting with Shmuel. Um, and Rita was from a very small town in Romania, um, and she was visiting her sister, who lived in Sasregin, and um, she was taken when she was visiting her sister. That was the last time she ever saw any of her family. Um, she was taken to an outdoor ghetto again, just outside the town, which is here, you know, which is now a farm, with no plaques, no knowledge. I don't know how many people in the local town know what this place was, but right now it's just a working farm. And I remember very early on in making this work, so this would have been about 2015, meeting with someone um, <coughs> who's an art director, and she... Um, she explained to me, and she said this really fantastic phrase I like to use, but I never say it's my own. That she says that Europe is littered with history. And it's very true that with every single step you take, and beyond Europe as well, obviously, every step you take, there is some trauma and some tragedy that has happened, whether it's current trauma and tragedy, whether it's something from 10, 15 years ago or something during the Second World War or earlier in that way. And Rita told me her story, how she was taken, and she was put into this outdoor ghetto. And from there, she was taken on trains, and she was taken to Auschwitz. And she was kept in Auschwitz for not a huge amount of time, because she was being used as work. And then from Auschwitz, she was taken to in Poland, obviously. And Auschwitz, she was taken to Lithuania. And she was in work camps in the coast in Lithuania. And this, the houses that you can see behind you, this is the site of one of the former work camps in there, which is now obviously a holiday camp, where people enjoy themselves, which is some, in some ways, is normal because you know we have a finite amount of land and we have to use it and maybe people don't feel a guilt or they don't feel a responsibility of what's happened in that particular physical space so they carry on their normal lives but i think it's important that they notice these things and in places like that there are very small plaques by the side of the road showing what this place was but again i brought my own knowledge there to that place um, and from Lithuania, she was then taken back to Poland, to northern Poland, to Stutov, which is on the Baltic coast, where she spent six or seven months, and she witnessed uh, torture, she witnessed murder, shooting, nearly died, was nearly killed herself. And then from there, she was taken on one of the death marches, which happened towards the end of the war, when um, the Germans and the other people controlling these camps were trying to clear the camps out, trying to raise th the things that they had done. <coughs> Excuse me, and she was taken on death march along the Baltic coast from Stutov, where I just showed you, and she was taken to this point here, and she was put into one of three barges, and the three barges were towed out into the Baltic um, and left to drift. No engines, obviously, um, <coughs> no food, no water. And she said they sat in these barges, not knowing what to do. She said they managed to drink some of the seawater because it was just after the snowy season, so there was snow and it was melting slightly. And she told me that they made that decision. Um, and I remember her words very clearly. She said, we could, someone said, we can die on the boat or we can die in the sea. Some stayed, some decided to swim. 
but they didn't know where it was. They didn't know which sea they were in because they didn't really know where the camp that they'd been kept in was. Um, they didn't know which way to swim. And if they did reach land, where would they be reaching? But they swam and many of them died in the water. Um, and then she told me how when they got to land, she saw some people by the side. But then these people started shooting at them. And many of the people that survived the swim from the barge to the water's edge were shot in that way. And I remember at that point, her daughter, Ronit, who was there with me as well, to kind of help with some translation and just to help be with her mum, because her mum was 95 at the time this work was made. Um, She'd gone over at that moment when Rita was telling me that part of the story, and she sat by her mum's knee, and she took her mum's hand. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and it was one of those moments as a photographer where I, I saw this thing, this vision unfolding in front of me. And there was a, a very small part of me that wanted to take a photograph, but there was a much larger part of me that didn't take the photograph because it felt far too personal, I think. But I did speak to her daughter about it the day after when I met with her daughter, and she said that she was happy for me to talk about it, which is why I can in this way. Um, but it was lovely watching those moments between um, of a mother who was 95 and a daughter who was uh, kind of late 30s, early 40s, who had no doubt heard this story before, but she was hearing her mother tell it to, who was, in all intents, intents and purposes, myself, a stranger. So her daughter was re-hearing it in that way. So with this work, what I did is I found it really important to, to go to the locations connected with these stories. So I'd met, over a period of two, three years, these 22 people, one of them, my own mother. Um, and then once each person had told me their story, I then visited all the locations connected with their story. Um, and I didn't know what I was going to find there but I knew I would find something because I'd been given this information. So I went to you know, camps, death camps that we've heard of, and concentration camps and ghettos that you have or haven't heard of. Um, I went to ravines by the side of the road in Moldova where five people had been murdered, a small lake in a country called Transnistria, which doesn't officially exist, but is there between Moldova and Ukraine, um, which were all connected to these stories that I'd been told. And everywhere I went, I found something to photograph, even though I didn't know what I was going to photograph beforehand. And I found that it was that small bit of knowledge that I took with me that in some ways the landscape spoke to me, not in a strange or bizarre way, but just in a way that it showed me what to photograph and what needed to be photographed, because I had that connection with that landscape by the history that had been given to me in that way. And so making all that work, it kind of it made me realize the importance of knowledge that we bring to places and that how we can view a landscape as a plain open empty ditch by the side of the road which is just another ditch by another road in northern Moldova um, or it can be much more it can be history it can be our stories it can be our culture and so for me as a photographer the idea is that I like and every word I use always feels wrong but I like to tell these stories so that these stories can be told again so, for instance, I hope this evening you go home, speak to someone, and tell them the stories I'm telling you today. And that way we're passing on this history, which I think is really important. And in a way, that's the way that we can retake this landscape. And it doesn't take anything away from what's happened in these landscapes, but it allows us to turn something, some trauma or tragedy into the past, and give it a positivity of sort, without demeaning it or belittling it, but taking something from it and sharing it in that way. I remember also when um, I'd met the next day um, with Rita's mum, or sorry, with Rita's daughter, Ronit, who also lived in Tel Aviv. Um, and she had told me this story, she had told, which when she gave me the words of the story, she was giving me some cake at the time. Everywhere I went, there was cake and coffee. And um, Ronit said, Mark, do you want some cake? And I said, oh, that'd be lovely. She said, it's Auschwitz cake. And so obviously my first you know, reaction is exactly the same as your reactions here. But Ronit told me the story of why her mother made her Auschwitz cake. And she said that when her mother was in Auschwitz in the camp, um, which this is a, a photograph from, um, she would lie there in the bunks. And she was quite young at the time, 15 or 16. Um, and she would lie in the bunks at night, and it was three or four bunks high, you know, 60, 70 women in a, in a room, in a barrack. Um, and all the women around her would whisper these recipes and they'd whisper the recipes for two reasons. It's one, because they didn't want to lose them. They didn't want to forget them. But she said it also made them less hungry. You know, they had no food. And the food, they, they obviously had some food, but the food they had was 
awful and horrible. But she said that by, by talking about their culture, by not letting their culture be erased and forgotten in that way, it gave them the food that they needed and the energy. And so that's where the Auschwitz recipes for the cake that I was eating came from. So again, it's this idea that if, if Rita's could talk about Auschwitz recipes, and if her daughter could eat this cake, which is called Auschwitz cake, which her mother made on her birthday, it made me realize as a photographer that there's something positive that I can be doing with this work and something positive that I can be taking from it in that way. And so that's what I did. So um, I spent five years on this work, or five, six years altogether with the making of the book, making these stories, sitting with people. I never, I never like to say that I talked with people because I try to say as few words as possible and I would just let people tell me their story. And um, the, the first question from them would always be, you know, what do you want me to tell you? But I never wanted to guide them with a p specific question because I didn't want them to only give me one answer. I wanted them to share with me what they felt comfortable sharing at that time. But I had to start with something. <laughs> um, so I, I would always say, well, tell me where you were born, you know, the village or the town you were born in. And they would talk and those 15 minutes would turn into half an hour and that half an hour would turn into one hour or two hours. And I found that if they would pause, I wouldn't try and fill that space with a question or a comment because they needed to pause because they needed to pause and drink coffee or eat more cake because there really was always cake and it was delicious cake as well. Um, and we'd be silent and we'd talk about something else and then they'd start talking again. And the stories they told me were never chronological. It wasn't from birth you know, to death, to where they were, to what had happened to their parents or their grandparents or their children or their brothers and sisters and aunts and uncles. It was, it was here and then there and then here and then there. But what was really, really fascinating for me and important for me is that they were sharing the things on that very specific day that they wanted to share with me. So Shmuel, for instance, who you saw in the first photograph, um, he hardly told me anything about his family, his experience during the Holocaust and the war itself. He just wanted to talk to me about what he had done with his life afterwards, you know, when he had survived, the positivity that he had taken from it in that way. And so even though I know what happened to him in the story, there's none of it in the work and in the book, because on that day, that's not what he wanted to share with me. And that delicacy to me as a photographer is really important in that way. Um, so as I made the work, which was set over about 150 locations or so, throughout about 22, 23 different countries, um, I found myself trying to engage with the landscape that I was visiting. And I did some quite strange things. I remember going to one place, which is a location or a site of a former camp in Poland, um, which is in a, in a major city, which is now a shopping centre with the cinemas and McDonald's. And I thought, I and I went inside to see what it was like. How would it feel to be on this landscape, which was this former camp? Um, and I ordered a cheeseburger because I wanted to know how it would feel to sit there in McDonald's on the site of a former camp and eat a cheeseburger. Um, and as you can imagine, I had one bite and that's all that I could stomach because it tasted like a cheeseburger, as every cheeseburger tastes. But it tasted horrible and I couldn't sit there and eat it. And I couldn't understand how people could walk around playing video games and how they could be shopping for shoes. I couldn't understand how they sat in the cinema on the second level, or the third level, um, watching action movies or Marvel films. How could they do that on the site of this place, of what had happened here, you know, 70, 80 years ago? But I realized, of course, that they didn't have the knowledge of what these places were. And if you don't have that knowledge, then why, why would you act in any way differently to the way that you do? But then I went back to that the first location I told you about, the uh, Dej, the ghetto. And I thought, well, maybe that's not true because a lot of people will have that knowledge if they've taken the time or they've just by accident noticed the very often very small plaque that says what happened at this site. And they may look at it and they may think that's terrible. And then they'll go and order their cheeseburger or buy their shoes or, or watch their movie. So I spent the whole time making this project. And like I say, I've still not found an answer, trying to work out how people live within these landscapes and what they can do to make themselves feel at ease in these places. Um, and I think the conclusion I've slowly come to is that there is this collective desire to forget. Um, I think as a race, we, as a you know, human race, and I think that's kind of exemplified with what's going on in the world today, um, we don't really like in general, to look at things, terrible things that are happening around us. You know, we'd ignore the floods, 
you know, we'll ignore the heat waves and the domes and the smoke until it comes to us, and then it's too late, perhaps. Um, but what I've... So we, so we do that, but we want to know as well. And so my job, and I think, you know, the same as Joe maybe thinks the same way in Gideon, obviously, with your work that I saw earlier on, it's the same thing, that our job as photographers is to tell these stories. And they're not always untold stories, but sometimes it's the idea of telling a story in a slightly different way, so a different demographic or a different section of society or people could understand these things. Um, so as I went through these locations, these 150 locations, I discovered these different ways of the landscape either talking to me or being guided by the landscape. And what I tried to do when I made the work is even though I'd been told stories of places, I tried not to have too much research of what had happened at these sites beforehand because I wanted to feel as an individual what it was like to step into this site for the first time with a, with a, bit, a bit of knowledge of an individual's experience there. Um, and I didn't want to have too many preconceptions as a photographer. You know, the last thing I wanted to do was go to a site knowing the photograph I wanted to take. I very much wanted these places you know, to talk to me in that way. And I remember here, which was at Natsuai La Stutoff, which is in Alsace in France. It's a concentration camp, the only actual concentration camp on French soil. There's many internment camps, of course, but this was a concentration camp. Um, and I remember seeing the camp behind me where you can see the guard towers and the wire and then noticing these um, kind of levels in front of me. And there was the smallest little sign there. And it told me that this was the guard's vegetable patch, which seems like a quite innocuous thing because the guards would work and live at these camps and they'd want to eat vegetables, whilst the prisoners didn't, of course. Um, but then what it said underneath is that the vegetable patch was fertilized by the ashes of the burnt, the burnt prisoners. So the prisoners that they had murdered they would burn their bodies, and they would use their ashes as fertilizer on that. So as you can imagine, it changes the outlook that I have when I go to a location, and it allows me to be, allows me to be shocked and horrified for that first time. And as a photographer, I quite, again, I don't want to say that I like that, but I think that's important, so I feel that full force of emotion. So I'm almost, you know, to, to some level, unprepared for what I'm about to experience. And in that way, I can try to feel what it would be like for someone else going to that location for the first time today um, and uh, evoke the experience that they may have. One thing I never try to do, of course, is try and evoke the experience of someone who was there during the war because that's an impossible thing to do. And again, at the same location was this small, um, small building, which was a former dance hall. Um, and it was a dance hall that was connected to the hotel that you can see on the right-hand side of the, of the image there. And the dance hall was converted into a gas chamber. This was in the same camp in, in France again. And I read how um, one of the doctors that worked at this camp, he got a very specific group of Jews from Auschwitz who were Thessalonian, from Th Thessalonica, excuse me, in Greece. And he had them put to the side in Auschwitz so they weren't being affected by typhoid, etc. And then he brought them to this specific place. And then he put them in this room and he sealed the door and he put some capsules with the gas that he was creating into the room. And he wanted to see that the, what effect this specific gas that he was making would have on the human body. And so this started, and this was quite early on in the work I was making it, so it started to show me the connections that were forming throughout the landscape of Europe, that this place, you know, in a very beautiful location in Alsace on the German-French border, which was connected to Poland and Auschwitz here, which was connected to Thessalonica in Greece. In the and then I read more, because I found that out when I was there, and I read more, and I then found out that the, the last capsules of vase where he had cut up the bodies after these experiments he performed and put them into these capsules were then taken to the anatomy department in the University of Strasbourg. And it was only about 15, 20 years ago that a cupboard was opened and these were discovered. So it makes another connection to that place again in that way. And then throughout making the work, I would, I would meet with people and they were telling me their stories. This is Anna and Arthur. Anna on the left, Arthur on the right. Um, Anna lives in San Francisco. Arthur lived in New York, but he passed away last year. And they were brother and sister who were originally from Krakow in Poland. Um, and when war came to Poland, um, and things happened that we all know about, um, they ran, they escaped. And they escaped to Lviv, which is in, was in Poland at the time, but is in current day Ukraine. Um, and Anna told me 
the whole story. I met with Arthur first in New York, and he told me nothing about the war because he didn't want to talk about it. So we sat and we spoke, uh, I think, about baseball, which I had no understanding of at all. And he asked me about cricket because he used to go to university in England in that way. Um, and we spoke about life. You know, he was like an 87-year-old doctor. I was a, what was I at the time, 49-year-old photographer, etc. Um, we had a fantastic evening and a really lovely com conversation. I remember all the food we ate, etc. But he told me nothing about his experiences during the war. But he said, Anna, she'll tell you everything. And she did, his sister. Um, his sister's written a book. She was a professor at the University of Berkeley, and she's written a book about her experiences during the war. And the amazing thing about the story is that she was younger than him, about four or five years younger, and the whole story that she told me was about how Arthur, her strong, brave, I think 11, 12-year-old brother, looked after her and kept her alive through all these locations. Um, and she told me about their escape from Krakow, how they went to Lviv, how they had to go into hiding, how they ended up in the ghetto, how they escaped from the ghetto on the back of a truck. Um, a German guard came in one day, and Anna told me that when this guard came into the room and she had been told never to talk to the Germans, never to talk to anyone in power like that. Um, and the guard came in and she heard the boots and her mother said, it's okay. And she was like well, crying, what do you mean it's okay? Said, He's going to take you, it's okay. And he had a, a cloth sack in his hand and he told Anna to get into the cloth sack and she climbed into a cloth sack and her brother was already in one of these cloth sacks and he slung her over his shoulder and he put her into the back of a truck, where Arthur was already in a cloth sack in the back of a truck. And there were a number of other cloth sacks in the back of the truck. And he drove them out of the ghetto. And I remember when I went to make this work, um, which isn't this location, but we went, because um, I was in Ukraine obviously working, um, and we went to the site of the former ghetto. And we found the house, the apartment where Anna and Arthur had lived with two or three other families. And there was a center central courtyard, and in the side of this courtyard, there were two cloth sacks filled with wood or objects. Um, and I knew, you know, I didn't know the sacks would be there, of course, but I knew the story because Anna had shared it with me. And it seemed that throughout the making this work, all these little stories that had been told to me, things would come alive at the places. So I had to photograph those sacks because it was important to do that. Um, and then Anna had told me the story of how they had escaped from the ghetto and then how her parents had also managed to escape from the ghetto. But they were never really told where each other were, so Anna and Arthur were kept in hiding, which was another house in Lviv outside the ghetto, which again I went to and ended up through complete fortune getting access to the apartment where they hid for a year or so, um, which is a whole other story in itself. Um, and then she told me that her parents had also escaped, and they knew they'd escaped, but they weren't told where. But she ended up being told that they were on this street in Lviv. Um, and then she started telling me the story about what happened to her parents, because obviously Anna and Arthur survived, but she told me how her parents hadn't survived. And she told me the story, um, the story that she knew. And then she said that when she was writing her memoirs about five, ten years ago, um, and when her brother Arthur, who had still never really spoken about these things, when he read what she was writing, he told her that that wasn't true, that wasn't what happened to our parents. Um, and I had been making work that day. We'd been to the former ghetto. We'd been to Anna and Arthur's hiding place outside the ghetto. And then we were out for dinner that night and we came out of a restaurant and I suddenly realized that there I was, I was on the street where Anna had been told, this is the street where your parents had been hidden after they'd escaped or been escaped from the ghetto in that way. And I didn't have my camera with me, like a great photographer. So I ran back to the place we were staying in and got my camera and I walked back up the street. And it's a beautiful street. It's full of restaurants and bars and Lviv is an amazing city. Architecture, culture, people, amazing. Um, and I knew what I was looking for, but I didn't know where to find it because I knew there was a house somewhere on this street where the parents had been hidden. But I didn't know where it was. And this is, this is a location that I came across that spoke to me in various ways. Um, but what I'll do is I'll play you now, Anna, her voice so you can hear her telling the story itself. It's about a minute and a half or so, if the sound works. A couple of days later, he found a woman who said that she would hide them for a lot of money. So she hid them. They built a false wall and they basically hid in that place with a little cutout where they could come in and out, in back of a chest of drawers, and that's where she put the food, yeah. But the woman was an alcoholic, and as 
this is all speculation because all we know is what we were told. So I was told by the lady, by La Lynn lady, that this woman went to a bar and must have said something that made somebody in the bar suspicious. And since the Germans paid bounties, he went to the Gestapo and said, I think this woman is hiding somebody. Gestapo went and what I was told was that they were all shot. Recently, since I've, Arthur read my memoir, he said, you know, I was told a different story. I was told that they sealed the apartment and that they died in the that was so nightmarish that I, I just couldn't deal with it. So I prefer to think, <laughs> however bad shooting is, you know. So there I was, running down the street with my camera, looking, looking for an apartment, looking for <clears throat> a space between walls where potentially Anna and Arthur's parents still were. For that, so every location I went to was full of, full of horror of course, um, and full of trauma and full of very personal tragedy to all these people I spoke to. And, and I don't have any pictures of what I'm talking about now, but one of those 22 stories is my own family story. And that's not often something I speak about when I'm talking about the work, but it feels like the right thing to do today. <laughs> um, and the reason I don't often speak about it is I've never wanted to make the work where, in, in general making this work, I never wanted any one story to be more important than the other. I never wanted any one location to be more important than the other. You know, whatever the amount of numbers of people that were affected at these places, every location, every individual story is as important as the other. So I never wanted to make a big thing of one of the stories being my own family. Um, because I, you know, whilst I was making the work and for the year or so since the work's been made, I always worry that if I spoke more about my own family story, would that put the other stories in the shade slightly? Would it make them less important? But what I've come to realize, and I've only realized this through talking about the work and having exhibitions and talking to people, you know, in the book, etc., um, is that there's never been that reaction to it. So, you know, whilst almost wanting to reduce the impact of my own personal experience in this work, to, to negate it in some ways by default, <laughs> by not talking about it, I realized that I was doing my own family a slight disservice. So even though within the book they have as much space as anyone else in the book in that way, in the work, um, I've never really spoken about it that much, but it's probably important to you. And it kind of goes back to, you know, Joe, what you were talking about there, that it's, you have, um, I think if you have a personal connection with a subject, it allows you to view it in a very specific way. And in some way, that, that way and that view can potentially be clouded by emotion. Um, your judgment can be altered by emotion and history you know, of what's happened to you or your parents or your grandparents, etc., or what's happening to your family today. Um, you have a unique viewpoint onto these things, and you, it's not simply a case of access, but you have a viewpoint that no one else can have, and I think it's, it's important to talk about it because it allows you to talk about something that maybe no one else can in that way. And Gideon, apologies, only came into your talk right at the very end of it, but it was as you were talking about your own family's connections to this, and it really does. When, when you have that personal connection, I think as a, you know, any kind of creative, whether it's photography or writing or poetry or filmmaking or sculpture, it's not something you can shy away from, however difficult it may be to do it, because it's important to do it. Not simply because it may potentially help you with any you know, emotional issues you have, but it allows you to help other people in a way that someone else can't. And I'm only actually thinking about these things as I'm speaking about them now. So this is a, an, an event in process, and I'm kind of realizing these things as I'm saying it, which I like that side of it. Um, so following my own family story was very difficult. You know, there was, there was tears at lots of occasions of making this work, but my own family story, which started in Romania, um, and trying to find a house, and trying to find a cemetery, and un uncover graves, which is where my mother's mother's father <laughs> story began in that way. And I remember driving to this small town in deep kind of western Romania, sorry, eastern Romania, um, and getting to this location and finding the street in this fairly dusty, you know, otherwise small town, um, 
and walking up the top of the road and knowing that one of those houses was the house where my great-grandfather lived and escaped from and had to escape from. Um, and then finding the cemetery. And it was quite late in the evening. And, and I remember opening the kind of wooden gate of the cemetery and these being attacked by dogs. They just came at me. And I managed to close the gate in time, luckily. But I remember being really pissed off because, you know, I'd travelled 49 years and 4,000 kilometres to try and find the cemetery and I couldn't get in because of some dogs. Um, and I kind of saw them go away and I kind of went back in again and, as you can imagine, exactly the same thing happened. So I ran out because I'm quite scared of dogs, especially when they're like that, in that way. And then a really lovely woman who was living in one of the houses along this small kind of hill came out and she asked me what I was doing. Um, she didn't really speak English, so she started speaking Romanian and I kind of explained in English that I didn't speak Romanian, which probably doesn't really work. But she spoke a little bit of French, and I speak some French, because um, my mum's Swiss, um, which is part of the whole story. And then we used Google Translate, of course, and she told me to come back in the morning and that she would help me. And so I did, so I went back the next morning, um, and she made sure the dogs who belonged to one of the other people on the street were kept hidden away. And we went into the cemetery and we cleared lots of these graves. And the amazing thing, amazing, again, the wrong word, but in the cemetery, half of the cemetery had been burnt two or three weeks beforehand. So one half of the cemetery was covered in this gray and black ash from being burnt, which also had lots of graves on it in there. But we did it and we found some of my family graves. And I remember thinking, we're looking at these graves of these cousins and uncles and my great grandfather, that they were the lucky ones because they had had a normal death in that way. But the night before, when after I'd been chased out of the cemetery and spoken to this very kind lady, I remember I was then driving back to the place where I was staying that night, and I didn't really know this about Romania, but you give people lifts very easily on the road, and there was an old guy who was kind of there, thumb out, or whatever, looking for a lift. And it was really the last thing I wanted to do was talk to anybody. I wasn't in a particularly good mood at that time, um, for reasons I've spoken to you about. But I'm generally quite a nice guy, so I stopped. He seemed quite old and needed lifts. So I gave him a lift. I remember he started speaking to me in Romanian and I started speaking to him in English. And then we kind of sat in stony silence for the 20 minutes that took me to drive him over the hill. And I kind of showed him on my phone on a map and he showed me where he wanted to go. Um, but I remember these feelings that I had. And this is probably the reason why I'm telling you this part of the story. Is I had real feelings of hatred at that time when I was in that car. I hated this old man who was sat next to me. I didn't know him and he didn't know me, you know? And he was old, but he wasn't old enough to have done anything specifically to my great, great grandfather in that way. But I hated him, you know? And the road was full of potholes and I hated and I detested every single pothole in the road. And I hated the dogs that ran across the road in front of me. And as you can hopefully tell, I'm a fairly nice guy. I hope you believe that. <laughs> um, and I found myself in this really strange position of driving with an perhaps a really nice old man next to me, you know, we didn't have much conversation, hating myself for hating him. But it made me realize how strong these emotions can be and how strong these landscapes and these locations and these places can be and how I needed to find a way to, to use that strength of emotion to share and tell these stories in that way. But I did, and I said, like, you know, I went, had a night in a hotel and I went back the next morning and we cleared the graves. And then I kind of sat in this woman's house and we ate olives and cake and coffee and I made a new friend and it was wonderful for that. So I spent a long time making that work um, and I'll come back to it at the end because I have more to talk about it from that. So quite a long time before that, I did another piece of work between 2010 and 2014 called The Last Stand which when I look back on it now is, um, it feels quite small in a way compared to my work about the Holocaust. It, and it feels, and this is a very bad way to sell my work, but it feels quite insignificant. Ignore that I just said that, obviously. Um, but insignificant in the way that it's not so overtly about individual stories. And I like working with individual stories. It feels, the, it feels like the right thing to do. But what I was doing when I was making this work is I was trying to tell the story of the landscape as opposed to an individual story. And so this work took four years to make and it was looking at remnants of Second World War coastal military defences around Europe. And I immediately knew when I was making the work that I couldn't just photograph an object because an object is just a cold, emotionless thing. But I had to photograph the object in the landscape, how it sits today and how that combination of object and landscape, even though they seem to be two very separate things, like in this image here, um, 
how they spoke to each other, and how they told us of our histories. But what I found as I made the work is that the more, the more I made this work, the more I started photographing things that were becoming a part of the landscape. And that I was looking less at big, hulking objects that would sit proud of beaches or coastlines. But I was starting to look at objects that were taking on the landscape around it in that way. Um, and I liked the fact that that was happening. And again, that wasn't really a specific conscious decision I made, but I found, as I made the work, that that seemed more interesting to me. More visually subtle as well, which I like. But in the work, it's, you know, it's good to have that combination. But it was the start of that joining of those two landscapes, in a way, together. You know, the joining of the man-made landscape and the natural landscape together. And then, when I finished that work, I spent five years making a wounded landscape. And then when I finished the wounded landscape, I was um, wondering what work I could do now, and I was approached by an Italian architect, asked me if I'd like to collaborate on a work with him. Um, how am I doing for time? Because I'm not sure my clock's working on here properly. <laughs> am I all good? Yeah, good. Um, and he told me that he was looking at First World War Italian mountain defences, and that he had seen my work, The Last Stand, and he was interested in collaborating with me, that he was an architect, practicing architect, but also a re research architect. And he was doing a lot of research about what he described as a new ecology, a creation of a third landscape, a creation of a landscape created both from man-made objects, but also the earth and the soil itself. And this combination of concrete and soil was not just these two very diverse things sitting together, but creating a brand new third species, a new ecology, as it were, in that way which is really interesting. So I obviously jumped at the chance, and after I just finished the Wounded Landscape, the idea of spending six weeks walking in the mountains of Italy was a very nice thing to be able to do, to kind of soothe my soul, which is lovely. So that's what we did. We spent, uh, I spent three weeks there, doing lots of research and making photo shoots, etc. in that way. Um, I remember when I went there, um, my wife was pregnant, so we went on a fair amount of walks. And then when I went back the following year, we had a little baby. So it was nice to take him to these two places. But it was a really interesting project to make because it allowed me to take what I'd made in the last hour, but to take it one stage further, to really show the combination of the creation of this new ecology in that way. And, and for me, it was quite a quick piece of work that it just took me a year to make instead of the normal kind of four years or six years in that, which is quite interesting. But it's, it's amazing these places you find. So this, the whole landscape that you see in front of you is man-made. The whole place that you can see here is a structure, is a building. But over the intervening years, the grass and the trees have come back onto it in that way. So it very much went along the lines that the architect was thinking about. So this is a natural rock formation, but the, the, um, the Austrians in this case had taken this rock formation and they dug tunnels into it and they created a mountain four out of that rock formation. So there's those two things there, and then over time again, there's a new ecology growing. So it's, it's interesting work in a different way. There's not, a, we didn't look at this work in a historical point of view. We didn't search out specific stories. So in many ways, it's very calm compared to my work at Wounded Landscape, and it's very easy to look at and fairly simple to talk about. And it was very easy and quite luxurious to make in that way. Um, but it has its own interest. And I think as a photographer, there's, there's space for me to almost do these two different types of work. And what I'm, what I'm finding, whether it's by design or by accident, is that I seem to do one calm work and then one very uncalm, very much story-led work, um, followed by another calm piece of work um, you know, that you can see here, and then into another story-based work. Like that. So again here, um, the front half of the landscape you see is completely natural. Um, the top half of the landscape is also completely natural, but it contains a whole fortification. So everything you see in the top half of the landscape, there is grass, but under not very much grass is concrete and bits of metal. And within that are all these tunnels. So it very much created a brand new landscape and a brand new ecology. So going back, oops, sorry, where am I? Going back to a wounded landscape again. 
Um, because that's the work that so far I've made is the most important to me and the one that I, I enjoy talking about the most because I think it's the most important work to talk about. Um, when I stand here doing a talk like this, I feel a, a real importance to give you very specific details of things that I saw. And I know very well that the details I give you are not particularly pleasant to listen to. Um, they're horrible, disgusting to listen to. No? Um, they're obviously not offensive in any way, but they're not things that you want to think about. But they're things that you have to think about. They're things that I have to think about. And as I mentioned before, I'd like you to go away with a job, which is to share what I tell you today with someone else that isn't here today, so you can pass that information on. So for instance, this is a forest camp outside the first death camp in Poland, Chelmno. And this is a forest camp of Wuschau. I've never known if I'm pronouncing that quite right, so apologies if I'm not. Um, and this was a place which was, as I mentioned, the first of the killing centers where um, they would take the prisoners and they would have them in a church. There was a church and there was a big, a big kind of house. Um, and they would keep them in there and then they would put them into a van and then they would drive in the van about two kilometers down the road to this forest site here. But whilst the prisoners were in the van, they were poisoned. So at the end of the journey, they were dead. And this carried on for a number of years at this site. And it's now, what you can see here is, is a memorial. And there's information panels everywhere. Um, it's very empty when I went there. I spent the whole day there and saw no one else at all. Um, but it was quite a cold, misty day, but I think that may say something in itself as well. Um, there's lots of sites there. There's sites of um, what they call death pits. And the reason they have these death pits is that when the guards and the Germans were leaving this camp towards the end of the war, um, they wanted to destroy all the evidence of what they had done. So the way they did this is they got the remaining prisoners, the ones who were still alive, they got them to exhume, to dig up the bodies of all the prisoners they had murdered. Um, they then burnt the bodies. They then built these very special machines, which were basically bone-crushing machines. And they took the burnt, the exhumed, burnt bodies, and they crushed them with these machines. And they then put them into sock, sock, sorry, um, into cloth sacks. And they threw them into this river, the River Varta, which is just literally around the corner from this forest. And so they would burn, the, they'd exhume these bodies, they would burn these bodies, they would crush these bodies, they would put them into these sacks, and they would empty them into this water here. And then when this area of this camp, this death camp was turned into a memorial site, they created these pits, which I don't have a photograph of here today, um, which are long rectangular areas of ground, maybe six meters across and about 20, 30 meters long. And these were areas where they assumed the bodies would initially have been buried. And they were also places where they could memorialize people. And they created these pits with um, bricks along the side. And then it was covered just you know, with the grass that was there. And this is the space where these people were. But what they found is that the sand in this area is, the soil, excuse me, in the sand is very, the soil in this location is very sandy. So what would happen is that some of these fragments of these crushed, burnt bodies would start to come out of the soil. So they covered all these pits with small stones. So you still have these very, quite beautiful in a way, rectangular pit areas covered in small stones. But as I was walking around this site, I noticed to the side of me where there wasn't any stones, these small white fragments. And I've given away what these fragments are, these small white fragments. And at first I thought they were just chippings from the pathway I was walking on, because some of the pathways through this memorial site is white stone. Um, but then you look at it more closely, and this was the second location I went to making this work. So this is very late 2015. And I was still, for want of a better word, immature with this work. I still hadn't experienced what this work was really about, because my family had never spoken about their experiences, um, never spoken about what happened, never spoken about the 46 family members that were murdered, for instance. And at this point, I hadn't yet met with any survivors because, or their families, because I didn't feel ready to do that. I didn't feel, you know, I, well, I felt, who am I for them to share their story to? And I felt I needed to go to some locations myself and make photographs and understand this work so that they could trust me enough to give their story to me. 
And so I'm walking along and I see these small fragments and I look close and I realize what they were. I realize these weren't stone chippings from the pathway, but these were bone fragments from those bodies that had been exhumed and burned and crushed and the ashes thrown in the river. And I remember very early on looking through the viewfinder of my camera with tears, obviously, flowing through my eyes, thinking, I, I can't take this photograph. But within that split second, I realized that I can't not take that photograph either and that I have to take that photograph for exactly the same reasons that Rita spoke about, that I have to take this photograph so that I can show it to you today, so that I can share what I'm seeing with other people, because it felt really important. So I remember that when Rita told me that she had to survive when she swam through the Baltic to the land, and she had to survive so she could tell her story, in some ways I understood that, not for the same reason, obviously, but the importance of telling stories in that way. How long have I got, Mick? You're looking at me. Five minutes. Okay. So, um, so once again, um, I'm making a new book, a new piece of work that I mentioned earlier on before. Um, and again, it's a work that I wish I wasn't having to make uh, for all the reasons that I've just been telling you about. But it's a work that we have to make. 